In this episode of Travelogue, I'm heading to the roof of the world to explore the famed capital of Tibet's autonomous region and the most sacred city for Tibetan Buddhists, Lhasa. Hello, I'm Tiran and welcome to this episode of Travelogue in China. Now, many of you might recognize the scenery behind me, but if you don't, I'm standing in front of the Patala Palace, the world's highest palace at an elevation of 3,700 meters above sea level. And I'm suffering a little bit from altitude sickness, but don't worry, we'll be taking it slow in this episode as we explore the fabled streets of Lhasa. Lhasa is the capital of Tibet Autonomous Region. The name Lhasa means place of gods, and the powerful religious atmosphere is evident the moment you arrive in the city. Nowhere more so than at the Patala Palace. <laughs> this magnificent building used to be the home of Dalai Lamas and is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So it might not be very tall, but at the top of the Yawang Mountain, you get the most iconic view of the Patala Palace as seen on the back of the 50 renminbi note. The Patala Palace as we see it today dates from the 1600s. It was built on top of an older 7th century palace, but unfortunately no cameras are allowed inside. However, I know a great location for getting some unique shots of the Patala's exterior. All right, so here's a tip for you photography buffs out there. A lot of people will just take pictures of the Patala Palace from the front, but if you actually make your way to the back to the Dragon King Lake, you get a really nice view. And also, if you're lucky, sometimes you might even catch the reflection of the Patala Palace in the waters. Today's not my day, though. But if you do manage to take some really nice photos, make sure to send them in to us, and then maybe I could pretend that they're mine. Due to its popularity, tickets for the Patala Palace must be booked in advance. Visitor numbers are limited to 5,000 a day during peak season. Well, it's certainly very busy, isn't it? So this is perhaps one of the most important and most sacred sites here in the entire Tibetan Autonomous Region. And if you've come to Lhasa, there are two places that you have to visit. One's the Patala Palace and the other is the Jokang Temple, which was built some 1400 years ago during the reign of King Songstan Gampo, who founded the Tibetan Empire, which ran for about 200 years. And even today, there are thousands of tourists and lay people making their way around the temple at all times during the day. Both the Patala Palace and the Jokang Temple are sacred to Tibetan Buddhists. Pilgrims will often travel for months on end in order to pay homage at these sites. This is the most important part of the Jokang Temple because inside that hall are statues of the Sakyamuni Buddha that Princess Wencheng brought several centuries ago and that's why there are so many people doing full body prostrations and uh, you know obviously the more you do the better but it really depends on your level of fitness and your age as to how many you'll do and for someone like me who's suffering from altitude sickness I think you can just do some internal prayers too. Princess Wencheng was a wife of King Songstan Gampo the man credited with introducing Buddhism into Tibet. When she came from the Tang Dynasty court to marry the Tibetan king, as part of her dowry she brought with her a number of sacred Buddhist relics, which are now housed at the Jokang Temple. Now, every day, thousands of pilgrims circle around the Jokang Temple while spinning prayer wheels. They do this to accumulate good karma in the hopes of getting a better rebirth. All Buddhists believe our world is an endless cycle of suffering involving life, death and rebirth. The way to escape it all 
is to become enlightened, and good karma can help us achieve that goal. The area around the Jokang Temple is called Barkor Street, and as you can see, it's, it's lined with shops everywhere selling you know, lots of tourist knickknacks, rosaries, tankers, uh, prayer wheels, and it, it might seem a bit touristy to you, but that's not the case because for hundreds of years, this was the most commercially active part of the city. In fact, it's the oldest part of the city because you know, thousands of pilgrims will come and visit the temple, and where there's people, there's obviously lots of business. A maze of alleys radiate out from Barcourt Street, and all of them are crammed with stores selling traditional handicrafts and Tibetan Buddhist knickknacks. You could pretty much get all of your Tibet souvenirs here in Barcourt, and uh, obviously, as you can see, there's a huge selection. But some of the ones that you do want to maybe purchase are these dodges, they're actually ritual implements, or maybe get a, a prayer wheel. And uh, these masks look pretty cool, but they're also actually ritual implements. And then there are these rosary beads, lots of different colors, and you'll see lots of people counting them as they walk along the streets. Barcourt Street hasn't changed much through the centuries. Pilgrims still continue to walk its streets while praying and prostrating them for hours, even days on end. I guess all this must be quite physically tiring. So when it's very high altitude, you've got to eat often, you've got to drink often, get those calories. And that's why I've come to this tea house. It's been around for 30 odd years and it's a very popular local haunt. <laughs> Man, it's pretty busy in here. I guess this <laughs> the menu is in Tibetan and Mandarin. So if you only know English, then uh, just, just see what everyone else is drinking. But um, I've got my friend uh, who's waiting for me in there, so he's going to help me do the ordering. Hello, <laughs> it's not bad. It's um, it's kind of like it's yeah, it's it's kind of like milk tea except milkier and more sugary. But you know, I, I like it. It's nice. But I see many people are putting food on the table. Is this one? Is this one? Is this one? Sweet tea is firmly a part of daily Tibetan life. Going to the tea house is a social thing, and many locals will come here after visiting the Jokang Temple and stay for hours chatting away. Coming up next, I join a local family in celebrating one of the most important events in the Tibetan calendar, Shoton Festival. It's coming out right now. Uh, Jesse's brought me to his friend's place. They're going to be visiting the Shoton Festival tomorrow, and uh, we're going to be joining them to see the big unfurling of the tanker. Lovely house. Wow. Nice. I like it. Mm. 学顿节就是我们这边有个说法就是酸奶节嘛我们把那个最好的酸奶供给我们的那些僧人嘛他这个斩佛是代表什么呀看一眼然后就比如说那个什么你一年
三百六十五天的。然后就我们把这打这打耶，就选了。那咱们是打给去几点的过去啊？凌晨两点。不会吧？对对对，两点。哦，哎，这好。给你准备的那个，哦，你试一下嘛。好，谢谢谢谢。呃 ，feel like royalty。哇哦！哈哈哈哈哈！袖子要折过来。啊，要折过来。要折过来。哦。One size fits all。Helpfully, the inside of the robe forms a pocket where you can keep your stuff. And as per tradition, the right arm is left uncovered. Too much, too much. Hey, can you make this? Just so bad. Yeah, this is pretty awesome. I've never worn such a complex outfit, but I guess if everyone's going to be wearing this tomorrow, or if we're out of place, it's going to be awesome festival. 明年都这样子穿着是吧？嗯，对对对，很正宗，那肯定很好，肯定很好，期待。Because there's going to be a lot of people at the festival, we've decided to get there early. Very early. Okay, so it's uh, three in the morning. We've arrived at the world's largest Tibetan Buddhist monastery, the Drepo Monastery. And there's already tons of people up there. Just hear voices all on top of the hill. Look at that, wow. That's huge. Obviously, this is where the, uh, the tank is going to be unrolled then. And uh, we're going to have to be uh, over there with the rest of the audience. Uh, I think the tank is coming at about 7 o'clock, and it's going to be coming up by the same route as, uh, as we climbed. And uh, if we're lucky, we might even be able to help out with the actual tanker itself. So uh, let's see. <laughs> It's raining now. Uh, there's, there's tons of people behind us. They've all, a lot of them actually even got up earlier than us. And the uh, tank is probably going to be unrolled a little bit later. Good thing we bought refreshments because it's going to be a while. So we need to drink some water. Oh, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. I think chanting earlier. I think the, the llamas are awake now. And um, they're going to be uh, doing their reciting their mantras. And then later on, they're going to be bringing the tanker up here. Yeah, it's it's going to be it's going to be pretty chaotic though, because as soon as the tanker starts making its way up, um, everyone is going to try and uh, get a chance to to grab onto it. So we're going to have to run. <laughs> <laughs> They've got experience, they knew we'd be standing here in the rain. <laughs> so that's why we've brought a lot of lot of backup. <laughs> Shoton Festival was originally a religious event when people offered yogurt to monks who were finishing their meditation retreat. The tradition started here at Drepon Monastery during the 11th century. And every year to kick off the festival, the monks will unveil a giant tanker on the hillside. They call it the sunning of the Buddha. I just hope the rain lets up. The tanker is extremely heavy. Even so, people are more than willing to help carry it. It's viewed as a great honor to be in contact with such a sacred object. Just by being here, everyone is accumulating good karma. Oh, 
long ago. We've been waiting the, literally the entire night. We got here at 2. It's been raining non stop. Everyone behind us is freezing, but finally things are starting to happen. Finally, I'm looking forward to this. I think there's going to be a race to the top, so uh, we've got to get ready. You might be wondering, what exactly is a tanker? Basically, it's a painting of a Buddhist deity, but the one here is 500 meters big. It's only brought out once a year at Shoton Festival, and supposedly, every time it's unveiled, the rain mysteriously stops. I can see that people have been waiting for hours, all that kind of anticipation and energy, wow, it's all just coming out right now. It's, uh, Pretty chaotic festival. Not chaotic, it's very busy. It feels like I'm at La Tomatina, except instead of tomatoes, people are throwing hadas or ceremonial scars. There's an incredible energy here, a mix of giddy excitement and wonder. Honestly, I feel awestruck just by gazing up at this giant tanker. Everywhere I look, there are faces revealing tremendous devotion. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. Just by being here, you've been blessed. Um, so I think it's worth it, totally worth it. We were waiting in the rain for five hours. We didn't even go to sleep, and you know there's thousands of people here. It's, it is quite chaotic to be honest, but it's all worth it at the end of the day. What a fantastic experience. Hopefully we'll get the same next year. The end of the unveiling marks the beginning of the festival proper. Coming up next, it's all about art as we attend a Tibetan opera, go backstage at a tanker school and get VIP seats for a song and dance extravaganza. It's a pretty big turnout today. But then again, everyone gets seven days off for the Shoton Festival. And uh, usually after people have watched the big unfurling of the tankers, they'll go to linkers, which are basically parks. And the most famous of the linkers in Lhasa is the Noble Linka, which was the summer palace of the Dalai Lamas. But as you can see today, there's loads of people here. A lot of them are carrying sacks and stuff in their hands because they've come to picnic and watch the Tibetan operas that are taking place inside. Thanks to the addition of performances like Tibetan Opera, 
Shotan was transformed from a purely religious festival into something for everyone. A popular feature is the picnic in the park, where people get together to eat, among other things, yogurt. I've never seen so many people picnicking at the same time. It feels like all of Lass is here. But uh, I hear singing, that's obviously where the Tibetan opera is. This massive queue. Let's see if I can get in. Oops. If all this looks a bit shamanistic to you, that's because Tibetan operas are mostly folk tales about good triumphing over evil. And during the seven day Shoton festival, troops from all across Tibet come here to perform and compete. quite know uh, what they're singing about. There are many different kinds of Tibetan opera, um, but what I do understand is that originally these were sort of rituals, which later became a form of opera, and uh, they're going to be performing pretty much the entire day, so it's, it's definitely a, a feat of fitness and walkout. Even these performances are abridged versions. There are nine different stories in the Tibetan opera repertoire. The complete story takes several days to perform. I just hope the actors can get some time off so they can take part in the fun and activities in the park. <laughs> Meanwhile, I've come to the Sue Dui Bai Tanker School to meet Gamma Gachi. He's an artist who's reviving a lost style of tanker painting. Uh, <laughs> Originally used as a meditation aid, a tanker is more a technical drawing than an expression of creativity. Like an architect, the tanker artist must first meticulously sketch out the blueprint of his painting before applying the colour. Chicago 还是一个它就是矿业了永远不会变色 
对对对，这是西藏一个古老的一个画派，很少、啊、很少见的。是什么年代的呀？啊，十三世纪开始，就是到十五世纪，十、啊、五世纪以后就断掉了这个画派啊。啊，没学校呢，重新再重复、啊。那这些唐卡都需要多长时间才能画出来？嗯，很好的一个作品的话，应该需要就是一年，还有最好的那些就是五年的。那您年六年多。您最好的作品，嗯，这个画一嗯，这个唐卡，比如说这个唐卡，画、嗯、一个人独立完成的，这个我在用了就是六年的时间、啊啊、完成的。然后这里边细节特别特别，嗯，对对对对对对，很细，好多小图像，对，你看这边，啊，最后面的那个就蓝色是，对，多有花纹，啊，这个画的不累吗？<笑>确实有点累，有点啊，自己喜欢就是在，这个就是自己留着了，嗯、不能卖出去了，对对。<笑> His other works, though, have been collected by temples and celebrities. Like many Tanka schools in Tibet, this one doesn't charge fees. Students board from a young age, and when they eventually become fully fledged artists, the school receives a portion of their earnings. It's a great way to preserve and promote the tradition of Tanka painting. Wow, it looks like it's a full house tonight. So、uh, I've come to watch a performance called Princess Wencheng, and by now, obviously, you know who she is. But the thing is, during peak season, it's sold out every single day. So I'm pretty lucky. I got one of these babies. The performance tells the story of Princess Wencheng's marriage to King Songstan Gampo. And it's on a truly epic scale, with song and dance numbers from all the Tibetan regions. Of course, Tibetan Buddhist motifs are evident throughout the show, but then they pervade everyday life in Lhasa. After all, everyone wants to accumulate good karma, because who doesn't look forward to a brighter future? Well, that's the face of the Patala Palace I've never seen before. I mean, to be honest, Lhasa turned out to be a little different to what I expected, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's always going to be an incredibly spiritual place that pilgrims will walk for months on end in order to visit, and every single day you're surrounded by the culture of Tibetan Buddhism. But at the same time, it's also just a regular city with regular families who live and work and play here. And I think if you can just get over the altitude sickness, you'll find Lhasa to be an incredibly rewarding experience. I'm Taran, and I hope you've enjoyed watching this episode of Travelog.